Sorry, we're a little late today. No, not a problem. We're just about to get started. Just as soon as my clock clicks over to 12.03, we'll, we'll do it. Oh, and there we go. All right, let's go ahead and do this thing. Um, hold on a minute. Uh, catch Fabio Jose later. All right, so agenda. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I don't think there's anything too exciting with the AIs going on. Just want to remind people that per the discussion we had, I think it was two weeks ago, um, we are going to cancel the conference call, the weekly conference call for KubeCon next week because of uh, being in Shanghai um, and the, because of U.S. Thanksgiving after the week after that. So the next two calls are going to be canceled if I have my calendar skills right. So just want to remind people of that. Actually, let me do this. Let me get bold, right, people? All right, community time. Is there anybody on the call who is not a normal person or not a normal uh, work group member who has an topic related to activities from the community that they'd like to bring forward. All right, not hearing any, let's move forward then. Okay, SDK work group. Now, Austin, I know you weren't able to join the call that we had the, I guess it was Tuesday this week, I think. So let me just quickly summarize what I think happened there that people can chime in. Mm -hmm. uh, the Golang and Java SDKs are well underway. There's definitely some activity going on there. Um, Clement said the, the C-sharp one should get started relatively soon, so expect some activity in that repo. We don't have a whole lot of activity. Actually, we have zero activity so far on the Python and JavaScript ones. Now, I know some people are interested in those, so if you are, please speak up and I'll give you um, access rights to merge and do stuff with PRs in there, but we'd like to see those get started as soon as possible. Uh, we did briefly talk about whether we wanted to have uh, some sort of overarching design document to provide consistency across the various implementations. And the general consensus at this point in time was that while that, that would be good to see if we can provide some consistency, it may be a little soon to be thinking about that because we want to get some initial code base out there so people to, to start playing with it. And then we'll take a step back and say, okay, where should these different SDKs with different languages line up better than they do right now? Since anything we come out with anytime soon would be an alpha anyway, we should be able to make some changes to align that. And hopefully it would be more superficial syntactical type changes anyway. Um, but that's kind of where we landed at that. People were more focused on trying to get something up and running first rather than looking at the, at the bigger picture type stuff. Uh, we are still kind of hoping to do an alpha, at least for some of these SDKs by KubeCon North America. Whether that plays out or not, we'll have to see. Obviously, each group is going to probably decide that on their own. But that's still the goal. So if you want to uh, try to make that happen, please you know, join the activities in the, in the particular repos. Um, from anybody on the call or Austin, is there any other comments? or topics that you guys think we need to bring up that I may have missed? Um, on my end, <clears throat> we have a, uh, we started an SDK design document that is there and um, it does provide some suggestions. It was mm -hmm. never meant to be firm requirements, uh, but just, just suggestions. So it's there for guidance, but I'm, I'm all in favor of just, you know, moving forward, getting something out there sooner than fast. Uh, sooner rather than later. So right. I think that's the best course right now. And then if anyone is curious or wants to learn more about stuff we've discussed, you could go look at that, uh, that document. Right. And just to let you know, you and I got an action item from this week's call. Whoops. Sorry. I did that wrong. You and I got an action item from this week's call to basically see if we, are, if we can produce some sort of status or plan or some kind of doc, because you're right, this doc is kind of what we've been using. Uh, for, the, for those purposes, but the problem is this doc also seems to serve the purpose of a running uh, notes document from each of the phone calls. So it may be a little difficult for someone new to the group to see exactly where we are relative to what they should be thinking about if they want to design, for example, a new SDK for a new language. So I, so we thought it might be good to pull that, those types of design decisions into either a separate doc or a well-known location, like maybe at the top of this doc, just something along those lines. So I was gonna work with you offline about that one. That makes sense. I'm um, sure. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments about the SDK work from people? Um, I'll, I'll read the doc as Neil here. Um, I'm just curious as to how we move forward with transport bindings and SDKs and whatnot. But I'll read the doc and I'll come back to you. Yeah. One thing that did come up on this week's call was whether we were going to have uh, uh, plug points or uh, extensibility points within the SDK so people can create new transports per SDK. And if I remember correctly, I think there was general consensus, consensus that that would be a good thing. That way you don't have to uh, modify the repo or 
do a complete recompile of everything just to add a new transport, you know, have some sort of plugin mechanism. But I don't think we got as far as to say what that plugin mechanism would look like. It, it may be very language specific anyway, but that's as far as we got was just saying, yes, it would be a good idea. Okay, cool. And I presume security concerns are kind of just out in the future for now. They have not come up in the conversation as far as I remember. So I think it's probably fair to say, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right, moving forward then. Um, I don't see Kathy on the call, so I don't, but I don't think there's been any activity in this workflow subgroup. So I think we can probably move on to the next topic. Uh, KubeCon Shanghai, uh, the slides are pretty much done. We've sent them in for translation. Uh, feel free to look at them. If you notice anything really bad that we need to fix, let us know. I think we can obviously make you know, small changes, but I think the basic flow is there. Um, so I think that's pretty much behind us. Um, interop work, we have four endpoints as of right now, IBM Oracle, a Knative one, and then an OpenFAS. Um, we are definitely shooting to do something in time for KubeCon North America. However, if we get enough participation, I don't know what the magic number is, but if we get enough participation that we feel like, hey, why not show this at KubeCon Shanghai, we may do so. Um, but please, if you're interested in joining or if you have an endpoint you want to include in there, uh, if you're not already, um, ping me and I'll add you to the Cloud Events uh, demo Slack channel. It is a private one because we do talk about endpoint and stuff like that. So we don't want those advertised across the internet. Um, but please join that and this doc that it's up here behind this work URL contains information about what your endpoints expected to do. Um, and we do make some design changes periodically as we go along. So you, would, you do want to join the Slack channel to keep up to date with those. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Cool. In that case, let's go ahead and jump into the PRs. Now, I did try to order these, put the easy ones first, because we have a quite a few to get through. And I want to get the easy ones out of the way before we get to the ones that might involve uh, some discussion. So this one was mine. Um, there's an issue um, that this, I can remember the gentleman who opened it up. I, um, but he basically was saying that as a newbie coming into our documents, it wasn't quite clear where to start in terms of which document to look at first, uh, just to you know, to warm, to, to 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 sort of introduce themselves into our into our work. So what I did is I added this these couple lines of text to the README, just pointing people to basically start with the primer, and then head over to the core specification. Um, just a little bit of guidance there, nothing too exciting. Definitely not normative. It's just in the README, but I want to make sure people are okay with this general text. Obviously, we could do tweaking later if needed. But I thought this was better than nothing. And the, uh, the original author of the issue thought this was good enough for his needs. Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, cool. Any other questions or comments on it? All right, any objection to approving? Excellent, cool. Um, Doug, I can't remember his last name, but it does start with an M. He's not on the call, unfortunately. Um, he had some minor cha wording changes uh, to some of our documents. I think he was just trying to get consistent. Um, for example, using the words producer and consumer throughout the entire doc or throughout all of our docs. I think that was probably the biggest change. Minor wording changes here. I don't think he, any of his changes are normative at all. Um, <clears throat> or if he did make any normative changes, it was by, by accident, but I don't think I spotted any. So these are strictly just, in my opinion, uh, syntactical or uh, types of changes. Uh, what do people think about this? Any questions or comments on it? It seemed like they're all good changes to me from a consistency perspective. I yeah, think this is the, the confusion we had before about occurrence versus event. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So that's good. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Any objections to adopting this PR? Excellent. Thank you, guys. Oops. All right, um, this one, I think I did because of you, Austin. You had mentioned something about how, oh, we had, when we had dropped the, um, the event type versions property, you were wondering about whether it made sense, uh, whether our decision to include as part of the event type string itself made sense, and you thought maybe some guidance around how you might include a version string or some sort of version type of information within the, within the event type itself. So I just added this text here and gave an example. 
down here, just trying to address some of your concerns to provide an additional clarity and direction for people. Does this at least come close to satisfying your concern there, Austin? Um, it provides additional clarity, so I think that's, I think that's good. Okay. Um, definitely not normative. Any questions or comments on this? Okay. What, one quick question, Doug. Mm -hmm. In this example, the version is in the middle of the event type. So com.example.object.v2.delete. Would you refer for it to be someplace else? Like after the delete? Yeah, I, um, I imagine that that whole event type is, is what the payload is corresponding to and then probably just pegging the version right at the very end. So you put a bit more sense. So you want that? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's uh, <clears throat> it kind of throws me off a little bit when I see it tucked in the middle there. Okay, that's fine. I think the only reason I did that was because I was thinking version one versus two may have actually different verbs. Um, but I don't honestly care. A, you know, I'm okay with this change. Anybody have any uh, objection to putting the V2 at the end? Okay, so let me make that comment. I can get that change in there. With that one change, is there any other comments or questions before I ask the uh, approval question? There was some, there was some um, talk about both the event type and the schema uh, fulfilling parts of the version field. I, I don't actually have any idea how to clarify that, but someone who did have the idea of using the schema should, I think, comment on that PR. Comment on how that could be used as well. Are you, are you suggesting that we may need additional text like this under the schema URL? I have no idea. I just remember from last week's call, someone else, someone else uh, pointed to the schema field instead of the event type field as a replacement for the event type version. I would like to hear from whoever that was about what they thought. Oh, does anybody remember that comment? Or the person who made the comment on the call? Might have, might have been me that I mentioned this, but only because it was mentioned at the original discussion a few months back. So, um, yeah, because I know schema URL, at least in my experience, oftentimes does include a date string somewhere in there or some sort of version string in there. So I think it may have been mentioned in context as an example of this type of stuff being done before, which is why we felt comfortable using event or uh, sticking the version string inside the event type. It may have just been used as, as an example. Yeah, I think we just talked of XML namespaces in that context. Yeah. Okay. Well, if someone thinks we need to do additional wordsmithing around schema URL, obviously we could do that. And if you don't feel comfortable creating a, a PR for it, then you know, go ahead and open up an issue and someone else will, will pick it up. So if anybody in the call feels like we need that, feel free to open I'll, it. I'll say one thing and I'll be, I'll be silent because I'm not feeling so strongly about this one. But um, back compat is a, hey, here's Microsoft. So a backward compatibility is a big, is a, might be a big thing where you have clients that are writing to the type, um, to a certain event type, um, the block created event, right? The one that we've used. And now that block created event changes slightly because it adds further information. Um, so that should have a new version number, but now the question is, are you willing to break all the existing clients I mean, all the existing subscriptions that are um, based on that old event, if you are just making a small and effectively ignorable change um, in the schema. So that's something that I'm, I'm generally worried about. So, so even if that's a, a rule here, um, Our approach to that, our approach to that, might be to go and just include a special version number in the message bot, in in the in the body, um, or if we have a URL to to uh, have that reflected in the URL, because I'm I'm really worried about uh, existing existing infrastructures and the existing applications that are assuming that they have that they have subscribed to the event, and that they expect a certain you know event type that they dispatch on, and then you make a new change. And you're effectively breaking your entire deployed infrastructure. So that's that's why I 
I'm, I'm uh, reluctant to have you know, the event type as the core dispatch criterion change with versions. So are you, I'm trying to figure out, are you suggesting that we may need just additional text in the primer to provide guidance on how to, on how event producers should be producing these, these strings, or do you actually think a normative change to the specification is required? I wonder. I wonder what that addition that we're that we're adding here is sending people down a path that might have consequences that they might not see um, um, if they're reading that. Because because if you only really make an add additive change in the schema, you really usually would not care. Mm -hmm. And and. So you know that now puts people into the into the conflict of you know, when am I really going to change the version number? Only if I have a breaking change, then that's probably justified. Um, but if I do you know a point release and I'm just adding data, which ideally you know by principles of uh, I always I always keep citing Sam Ruby, um, you know it's okay to add things. Um, then, um, then you never do a version revision and, and just keep things the same. So I'm, I said, I, from an implementation perspective, I know how to go and deal with that. It's just for me that the question of, of what the guidance is that we're, that, we're, that we're giving. So I don't have a strong opinion if other people feel about you know, this being the way how we should go and guide, guide, guide people. Um, but I'm just, I just want to point out the risk and with that I'm done. Okay, so Matt, I think that that little symbol is you trying to raise your hand. Matt? No, that was me joining the meeting present. Oh, I thought you were trying to speak on this one. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, well, so let me ask you this, Clemens. Um, would you prefer if we hold off on this? It, the guidance makes me a little uneasy. Okay. Well, like I said, I was hoping to get the easy ones out first, and this one sounds like you're a little nervous, so I don't want to rush it. So let's let's table this one for right now. How's that? And then we can revisit it to see whether we just kill the whole thing, add additional text, either here or in the primer. Let, let's let's talk about that later. Is that fair? Can, I don't want to rush it. Can, can I just uh, comment on that, Clemens? Yeah. Uh, since you're talking about additive changes, now that we're talking about it more, I think originally in the discussion, the point was that it would be major version changes would be a part of the event type string. So breaking changes and additive changes would be dealt by having the schema change anyway. Because if you have additive changes, you should be changing your schema URL probably with a date or something as Doug was talking about. So, so I would propose that we have a, a versioning discussion. So you can use the event type, you can use that, that event type attribute as, as, as you like. Right, obviously, you can use it for version, you can use it for everything. So I, I think instead of putting this here, we can make a version section that says, and here's three ways you can think about versioning and really how you deal with them is really up to you, but that's kind of, so basically make, making the guidance thing, but not making that necessarily um, um, a, and it can be even in the normative part, but I, I think the standing alone is complicated because schema URL plays into that. Um, and, and as we said, you know, you want to have a major change versus a minor change. And I think that needs to have a little bit more explanation. I, I'm just, I, I'm just worried, worried about it from an ed education perspective, not sending people down the wrong path. Okay. Well, like I said, let's hold off on this one. I, I don't want to rush this, especially if you are correct, Clemens, and that uh, it may lead people down the wrong path. I def that is definitely not my intent. I thought it was minor. I thought it was mindless text and it's not. And, I want to take a step back and think about it some more. So let's take this one offline and see if we can address your concerns and then come back to the group with a more with a different proposal. How's that? Right. Uh, also, I just want to chime in real quick, Doug. I think mm -hmm. Clemens, Clemens has a great point. And if we're going to usher in this, this event-driven future, um, we really have to give some pretty good guidance as to how cloud events can help data evolution. Um, and I think Clemens' suggestion of just writing some of that guidance in here as like an, an initial step until we get this out to the market and, and learn more and see how people are approaching the problem. Seems like a good one. So I'd, I'd encourage you to see um, anything in that direction. Sounds like a good initial step. 
very kind of you. Okay, cool. Thank you, Clemens. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, and, and as a reminder to anybody on the call, please, if you ever feel uncomfortable about something, want to bring um, up some concerns, feel free to the exact same way Clemens did. Because at times when we start sort of rushing through some of these PRs, I'm, I'm doing it mainly because we only meet once a week, and I want to make sure we get through as much as possible. But even if you have just a nagging feeling like Clemens did, feel free to mention it, and that will slow us down, and we can take it offline and discuss it. I definitely don't mean to rush things. So thank you, Clemens, for doing that. I also think the separate section for versioning or scheme evolution as a guidance sounds like a great idea. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, next one, Christoph. And I think you actually just joined the call, too. So maybe you yeah, want to talk to this one? Yes. So uh, we had a... PR that we discussed uh, on last week's call uh, from Fabio. And basically he came and said, I took your JSON example and I tried to pass it by the JSON schema and it didn't validate. And it didn't validate because you used the relative uh, URI, but actually you say it should only be a URI. And then there were multiple people, including me, uh, who said, yeah, you're right. We only support URIs. Uh, but actually then Doc found out this is not true. So if you scroll down to the uh, spec, you would see that we actually said all the time here um, that is a string exp expression conforming to URI reference. Well, then we go and name it URI and then everyone is confused by that. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the JSON schema, you can see that the mistake was applied there. So in the JSON schema, it actually said URI or it should have said URI reference. So with this PR, I'm trying to make the name URI reference so that it should be clear for everyone who reads the spec that this is not a plain URI, but a URI reference. And I'm also fixing the JSON schema. And I'm also adding uh, one more example um, to the spec, uh, the last uh, change basically, that's a relative URI. Yep. Okay, any questions or comments on this one? All right. Oh. Any, oh, I'm sorry, was someone going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, is, has there been any discussion about whether the relative URL, URIs are actually wanted? Like... Many moons ago, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it, so this, this was, this, we had a long discussion about URI references versus URIs, and we, let, we literally landed on URI, URI references. We can open that box of Pandora again, um, but there are cases where you um, are acting. So, so the argument was, if you are if you are acting wholly within the scope of a single system, then further qualifying the the URI might not be necessary. Example, um, Azure, um, the events that we're raising from the Azure platform all have relative paths because they're relating to Azure.com because it is the Azure platform that is raising those events and effectively the event paths are all um, ending up being unique because they're anchored on our resource structure. So, so for Azure, we don't need to have absolute URIs, but we would want to go and distinguish between these and URIs that are not part of our scope. So we would also then allow absolute URIs um, if they refer to other scopes and other systems. Yeah, great. I just wanted to ask if there had been any discussion. That that's yeah, great. We had, uh, yeah, we had a we had a debate about this, and I think the debate lasted like eight weeks. Just <laughs> 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 uh, just an additional question, since you brought up great example. When you export events from Azure Azure to another domain, would you then still keep the relative URL or URI? Um, uh, yes, because the event type, um, it, so the event type is meant to be domain qualified and it, act, and it actually is. So you can already tell from the event type what that is and where that comes from. So you have that, you have that qualification, but yeah, if we, if we think about federation, if we're thinking about federation across systems, then we might go and consider, um, adding, uh, the, uh, uh the URI. We're having some, um, I don't want to, you know, 
expand the scope here all that much in that discussion, but um, there is th there are some thoughts that we're having in a different realm that's kind of related to this, and I'm probably, probably going to bring this here because we have an NQP binding uh, about addressing in general, um, and you know thinking about what are logical identifiers versus versus actual network addresses, and that kind of plays into that because Azure.com in that sense would be really just a name. Um, and then the question is, you know, what is the right name for the sources? What is the right URI? What is even the right URI scheme to use for those? Because, you know, HTTP or MQP is not the right thing because these are not addressable entities and those prefixes imply, a, you know, some protocol behind it. So these probably should be your ends, but then, you know, what is, there are no rules governing the uniqueness of the, uh, the authority portion, if you don't have a, have a um, scheme that matches that. So we're trying, so in AMQP specifically, we're trying to, we're trying to go and resolve some of those concerns about multi-level routing, etc. And so once we have a, have a model for that, then we um, uh, will probably want to bring that here. Um, or obviously you're all invited to come to ASIN. All right. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Sounds fascinating. So, okay. So I think there are two things coming out of this. One is, it seems to me it might be good to add, even if it's just a short paragraph or a sentence or two to the primer to explain why we allow URI references. And I added a, a note to the, to our agenda doc to make a note of that, then I'll do an action item around that or try to get someone to do an action item around that. Cause I do think that'd be useful to explain that. And Clement, I thought you get a, a good example of why that might be needed. Um, but the second thing and more important thing, is this PR itself? Any other questions or comments on this one? I love it. There you go. That's a good comment. Anybody else? If nothing else, it definitely provides clarity, which is good. Okay. Any objections then to adopting it? All right. Not hearing any. Thank you guys very much. Clemens, hopefully the next easy one. Integers. Would you like to quickly talk to this one? Oh, I don't even get any delta during this call. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this was easy. Uh, that was an omission. Um, this was, um, it was noted that when we added the integer type to the abstract type system that it wasn't in the mappings and that was correct. So. I just added that um, and uh, for the JSON format, since we only allow integers and I'm, I'm trying to keep the, at least I am trying to keep our type system compact. Um, I'm literally making the constraint that you can look at the JSON number there, but you can only really use an int. Um, and if you look at the, if you look at the JSON spec, we don't have to go and click that. Um, you'll find that in that section, they talk about an int component and that is expectedly an integer. Um, and then I'm just adjusting the text. Um, and um, I, I made the text a, a little bit more robust um, at the bottom, like line 81, where I'm saying basically it can be any valid type so that, that I got out of the enumeration and have to go and uh, adjust that all the time. Um, and then above, I'm making effectively the same change, uh, mapping the in, our integer type to uh, um, the MQP long for the MQP type mapping, which is the other one that we have. Yep, and that's up here. So there are no, there, there should be no surprises. And for um, AMQP, I didn't have the we, we didn't have that that word that we have for. Um, um, for Jason because MQP knows that that construct of the any type uh, by itself. Right. All right, cool, thank you. Any questions or comments on this one? All right, any objection to adopting? Excellent, thank you, Clemens. All right, All right. protobuf. I don't think Spencer is on the call. Now this one has been out there for quite some time. I think there were some, I, in my opinion, I thought relatively minor updates recently, um, but at least three days ago or more. Um, let me ask any of the Googlers, Rachel or Scott, is there anything you guys would like to add on this one before I ask if there are any questions or comments? Any 
comment you guys want to make? I think Spencer tried to address the changes that people brought up. So if you see something that is still not addressed, that we like, let me know and we can address it. Yeah, I think yeah. you did get everything. I agree. So, I, hey, this is Jam. So I, I just want to raise the comment on the uh, media types. Um, and I know, you know, Spencer had sort of commented on that, but I didn't see any updates to the documentation sort of describing what we should do, you know. So, well, so in the last comment, he was saying, oh, so you're saying that you would like to see a change in the PR itself? Yeah, so I mean, I, so my whole, when I looked at this, it was more around, okay, you know, when you pair this with the other transport bindings, and they say, okay, you know, look at the media type that's going to tell you what, what the payload is, yeah? Um, and given that there isn't a registered one for protobuf, what I really was looking for was this standard to say, and this is the media type we'll use, yeah, to actually make it explicit. Okay, I'll pass it along. Is that something that would be in the protobuf spec itself already? Sorry, was that a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering whether the protobuf spec itself um, dictates what the content type would be. It doesn't right now, but it could. Okay, I, I didn't want us to repeat stuff. That's the only reason I was asking. Um, okay, so, so Jim, I'm trying to figure out if, okay, so you're asking for that change. Um, I, the reason I'm, I'm hesitating here is I know this PR has been out there for, for quite some time, and I feel bad that we haven't uh, merged it yet because I don't think there's anything major that needs to be done to it. I'm not, not discounting your, your content type thing. Obviously, I do think that's important. I guess what I'm kind of wondering is would people prefer to wait until that, is, that change is made to this PR, or could we do that as a follow-on PR? Well, I can like, so, so to be clear, I don't want to say like, we'll definitely include that. I want to say I can pass that along to Spencer. I don't know if we include that in the other specs. I assume that we do, but I don't know for sure. I have to go check. Uh, we did. In the, in, in the JSON spec, spec, JSON format, in the envelope section, it says such a representation uses the media type application slash cloud events plus JSON. So this one basically- could be proto. Okay. Would be plus plus pro plus protobuf because that's what that's the, we're using this the plus notation format where we basically have a base type. We still have to register that one, by the way, and then um, we're effectively um, uh, adding the uh, the encoding format at the at the end of that. So it would be application slash cloud events plus protobuf. So what do you guys want to do? Would you like to see if we're going to merge this one as is and do a follow-up PR or wait until this change is made before we consider adopting it? I can go either way. Is that a question to the entire group? Yeah, mainly to, I think, you Googlers and Jem, because you guys are the ones who are focused on the content type question, but to the whole group in general, too. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think it should necessarily hold this up, but if you merge this one, I'd like an issue or something to be opened up sort of fairly promptly afterwards to get it clarified. How about, uh, how about this? How about we merge this and then I will open a PR against this as soon as it merges, against this file as soon as it merges to make that change? Yep, that works for me. Yeah. Like I said, I, I just feel guilty because I know Spencer spent a lot of time on this and it's been lingering for a while. Um, I don't want to nitpick it to death. Okay, so the proposal out there is to try to get this one in, assuming the group approves it, and if it is, do a quickly follow on PR to, to address Jem's content type question. So, any objection to that process? Okay, not hearing any objection then. Is there any objection then to adopting this PR as it stands? All right, cool. So let me just make some notes here. Do, 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 do. Approved. Um, all right, cool. Thank you guys very much. Uh, Jim, yours. Do, do, do. Oh, okay. <laughs> this one. Would you like to? quickly talk to this one. 
Sure. So I mean, I, so this was one that um, I rather foolishly promised to do last week, uh, just really to reduce and simplify uh, the uh, property and attribute naming. Um, and I think the only one that was sort of questionable at the time was whether um, people wanted to reduce the attribute called cloud events version to version or spec version. Uh, so this change uh, is actually to reduce that to spec version. Um, there was one comment, I believe, from Roberto. I don't know if he's on the call. Yeah, uh, I'm on the call. I yeah. think ID is too generic because there's so many IDs in JSON. So I think that this is the one that I would prefer to preserve as event ID instead of ID. That's my only comment. Right. So my, my, I think my response to that was um, I have no strong opinion. I, I think I'd prefer it to stay as ID because it keeps it consistent with everything else. Um, but, you know, I'll go with the flow if the group wants to, to change that, then I'm, I'll do that. I, I'm not wedded. Um, what I would say and apologize in advance to um, the people working on the Kafka uh, transport spec, because if this gets merged, then your spec will need to change as well. Yeah. yeah, I think we've got a few dependencies upon other stuff at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so let's, I think there are two open questions then, aside from the overall question about the PR itself. So first, cloud events version changing to spec version. Is there any concerns about that change? Okay, I think uh, that may have actually been driven by uh, Austin's request last week too. So hopefully he'll be okay with that. And I think he actually was, he, um, per what he said in last week's call. So I think the bigger question, more interesting and possibly harder, is event ID versus ID. Uh, what do people think about that change? Are we waving hands or? Uh, yeah, or just speak up. You can either put a plus hand in the chat or just start talking if no one's talking yet. I'll be quick. Um, I think it's contextual. So I, I'm okay with ID because you're only going to see the ID ideally in the context of a cloud event. So I think it's kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, I agree. I'd rather have all of them either be prefixed with event or none of them having event uh, as a prefix. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, this is Vladimir. I would also prefer just to have it clean uh, without the prefix event in front of everything. Okay, thank you. And obviously I haven't biased him at all in that. <laughs> yeah. I guess I agree. I'm, out, I'm out outnumbered. Well, let's let's I agree. Let's... I prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Roberto, uh, since you seem like you want to shortcut it, let me, let, me, let me change the question. Is there anybody on the call who strongly feels that it should remain event ID? Okay, so yeah, Roberto, I think you're you're kind of outnumbered on that one, um, but it was, it's interesting that you mentioned it though, because this is this is the exact example I think I used last week on why I thought prefixing everything with event might actually be good, and because I, I said you know ID versus foo ID be kind of annoying, um, but anyway, um, so I think the general consensus so far is that keep it with ID without prefixing it. Um, is that fair conclusion, or is, am I misreading the group? Okay. Oh, go ahead. I think uh, the event ID is better, but in the face of everything else changing, the not having the events in front of it, it would look weird and break consistency. And as such, even though it would be better in terms of understandable, it's not actually better. Yeah, I agree with that. It would be way clearer, but if that one has events uh, in front of it, all of them should. Like we can't have an event just on one. It, we would definitely get PRs and people would get confused if just one of them has events. It's like, okay, time is the time the event was generated. Is, is it the time of the event? Is it the time of actually sending the event? So if one has event, all of them should have event in front of it. So I'll raise my hand here, not as a moderator, but I, I would tend to agree. If we're going to do it on one, we got to do it on all for consistency. I like consistency a lot. My, my head is much happier that way. But anyway, so any other questions or comments on this PR then? 
Okay. Any objection then to adopting it and watching the ramifications fly? Okay, not hearing any objections. So this means that once this thing's merged, we gotta change our demos and, and the Kafka spec. We just broke the world, but that's- okay. We did just break the world, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. You. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's 0 0.1, so. I know, it's safe, it's just funny. Um, okay, uh, last one. This one I thought might take some time based upon some recent comments. Uh, Neil, would you like to talk to this one, the Kafka of transport? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it follows in line with the other transport bindings. Um, there's been a, a bit of a discussion about halfway down where we talk about the, the header mapping um, and I'll prefix everything with cloud events underscore. Yeah, that's it there. And we weren't sure, and so I asked Doug, he, uh, and I also asked Clements. Um, and I think the interesting thing is at the bottom, Clements has said it looks like we might be going for a C underscore. My concern is if we're propagating cloud events between multiple uh, transports, we don't, ideally, we, we want consistency between those transports so we don't have to do any kind of namespace mapping. Um, but I'm really looking for opinions from other people as, as to, do we have a standard consensus for how the transports propagate events between them? So, so generally, the, the, um, um, effectively what this prefix does, it gives you a namespacing within your uh, transports. Um, you have two namespaces, you have your transport space properties and stuff that is necessary for routing and handling stuff on, on, at, at your transport level. And then we're effectively taking the metadata that the cloud events brings, certainly for the binary, for the binary uh, uh, um, mapping, and we're kind of overlaying this. So since we now make our world very easy and very compact by just, uh, just did with, with ID, we now need to go and namespace things, right? So, so if you if we now say for for the for Kafka, you make CE underscore ID and CE underscore time and C, you know, all those, then if you're presenting this up in an SDK, um, then you would basically go and toss all those prefixes out, and you would simply, simply surface the normal names for cloud events. And if we're doing these, um, if we're mapping stuff onto the in onto the transport frame as we're doing with that binary mode, then you already need some code that sits in the middle that kind of does the translation between transports. And the logical way of doing that is to go through the SDK. And the SDK will therefore go and, and present you normalized names. And then you go with those normalized names back to the transport, web, the other transport, the next one, HTTP, where they will again be prefixed so that they don't clash with the wire reality in, in HTTP. So I think of these of, of, of these prefixes that we have in the in the wire representation, really just as uh, a namespacing trick to disambiguate from the the native uh, headers that you have there. But in terms of how you project this out to an application, um, these prefixes basically just go away um, because they're giving first they're giving you a filter condition for how you can find even even if you don't if your SDK implementation doesn't know about all the cloud events headers because we have the um, extensibility, then you know that they originate from cloud events because they are C underscore prefix, which means you can go and collect them all up, strip the prefix and present them as a collection. Okay, so in that case, we can go with like a, a packaging semantic with like the io.cloud events. Yeah, exactly. Within, within the binding, okay, that's good. Yeah, you can use what's idiosyncratic. So, so for, for MQP, I'll probably go and change this to CE colon because that's the idiosyncratic way to represent this because AMPP uses as a kind of implied namespacing model. And then we have CE, da CE dash for HTTP because it's idiosyncratic there. We don't need to have those things look alike, I think, because we the, the assumption is that we'll normalize off the transport um, into the normal names. Okay, that's great. Um, and the other thing was this, uh, there's a dependent PR here with the event key. Um, and obviously we can't put data into Kafka without 
it belonging to the correct partition. Um, I have a comment on that as well. Yeah, so so I think Jay Roper or John Roper opened a PR a while ago. It's been open for some time. And I know you left a comment earlier today about yeah. exposing transport binding dependencies up the 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 to the event model. Um, the question is, um, if we do hide it within the, the data payload and that data payload is binary or it's encrypted or it's secured, then for whatever's actually trying to look at that to extract out the, the event key, is it's, it's a fair bit of overhead. Um, it also might break some security concerns, which we haven't kind of got to yet. That's true. But then if you have, if you have payload specific information, I would argue that you then have a header that you're promoting out. So you have a, effectively an attribute that you're promoting out of your payload, which is payload specific, which is yeah. so, because that, that, that is then an extension. And I think what the, 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 Kafka, the Kafka binding ought to do, it ought to have a, um, um, an expression effectively um, that can define how you fish some element out of the event that he can then go and use as the event key. You know, that, so basically in the subscription, so the, the, I, I think of the, I think of these transports as effectively subscribers to the event flow. And you might have the situation where, um, as I wrote in that comment, where you have a device and the device is publishing events over, over MQTT because that's the only protocol it knows. Those ends up, those end up in uh, a gateway and that gateway then turns around, takes that event and throws it down a Kafka pipe. At that point, the MQTT, the device is oblivious to the fact that you want to do that with it, right? And it's been you know, shipped with MQTT support four years ago, and and you might not know. Um, and of course, it had it has known Cloud Events 1.0 at that point. Um, and um, then you need to have a mechanism, I think, to go and construct. You need to have a rule to go and construct a partition key for Kafka because it always needs one from the content of the message. And that might mean that you, you know, map from an existing attribute. That might mean that you go and, and do a query into the, into, the, into the payload. But I think you, you'll effectively have to do a reference to, a, to an attribute that's in the message without that attribute in the message being you know, predestined to become a Kafka key. Like from a conceptual yeah. perspective, in your implementation, you could do whatever you want. But from a from a um, from a conceptual perspective, I think that the Kafka binding should have should basically refer to stuff in the message, and then make that the key, rather than for us to have a preconceived notion of key from the start of the event flow until it potentially sometimes hits a Kafka endpoint. Yeah, I guess I guess the other the aspect of this, I mean, un until we figure out two one eight that uh, that Doug's Doug had opened about the event key f field um, or property is until we can figure that out, we, we're not really sure what to do in the Kafka transport binding. I mean, there's been some proposals to um, append it to the source as some kind of um, like a URL parameter or something like that. Um, but we, yeah. What do you mean? It's something that needs to, so like, Say the source is a IoT device, and then you've got an ampersand event key or device source or something like that um, becomes the event key. You can. And so then, if we the other, do that, the other, then. So the, I think the other thing you can do hmm. is the. Uh, so the simple way of solving this is, of course, the Kafka binding can make an extension. Um, and say, here's here's the default key that we're picking up. I mean, it could default to source, um, but that's not going to please everyone. There's always going to be some kind of scenario that source is not sufficient. And, and see, that's and that's why that's what my concern is because um, the, our event hub works the same way, right? And we we just released the, the Kafka binding for that as well, so we have the same problem. Um, the way how you're choosing your partition, your partitions really also depends on the use case, right? You might go and want to create partitions based on event type, 
You might want to create partitions based on the source. You might, um, I mean, there's all kinds of criteria by which you want to go and, and partition your event stream up for processing. And having some kind of mechanism that allows you to say, you know, in my binding, um, I can, in, 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 my, in my implementation, I basically, say, I basically select a criteria, I select effectively the expression, whatever that is, that then points to the, the, the cloud events message and does a transform and that transform yields a key is I think better because you can, you have, you have more flexibility than if you have to go and put a key in a priori into the message, even though um, uh, the, the ultimate sender, uh, the sender might not even know what your, your partitioning criterion is. Because, uh, because there's always the, the case of, you know, the single device sits out on the edge, sends stuff in, and then you have, you know, concentrator, concentrator, concentrator st step, and then in the second level concentrator step, that's when you want to have some different partitioning that the, that the device has no concept of. So, so we've got a couple people with their hands up, and I want to get to them before we run out of time. So Christoph first, and then Vlad. So go ahead, Christoph. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with Clemens. I think it's somewhat similar to routing. So in, I'm mainly looking at it from a producer perspective. I don't know how my consumer will want to root the stuff. So what I want to do is I want to give them options of what they can root on. This event type, this on my source, or I may be going to put a bit more data than is uh, strictly necessary. I may introduce extra uh, attributes. So, and then the consumer or the middleware can decide where and how um, it's going to root based on these attributes. And I think the same should be true uh, for the partitioning. I'm just providing attributes and then whoever sets up um, their um, middleware can decide what they want to partition on. This is for me as an event producer, it's really hard to pick the right partition key and there's probably not one that will fit all use cases. So which one ever I'll pick, I will make some part or some people unhappy. Glad your hands up next. Yeah, all I, my comment is on the same line. Like, what about the producers that can't, for some reason, generate the uh, partition key? That's not ideal, and having this as a required field is not ideal. And I do believe this would be perfect as an extension. Like, if it's there, if the partition key is there, use it. If not, we're gonna combine it in this way or generate it by concatenating these three fields with source ID, event ID, and whatever. Okay, uh, Tapini, I think you're next. Yeah, to uh, co continue from Clemens's comment, uh, you, the producer cannot know the partitioning strategy for all, all of the consumers. It, it's just not possible. So, but, but what, what I actually want to comment on is, does it make a difference whether it's an expression in the field that points to another field or just duplicating that data from that field into the event key field. What, why, why do you prefer a path expression or something? So can I jump in here just for a second? I wanna make sure that we're, we're talking about this only within the context of the, tra of the Kafka transfer binding. I don't think, I didn't wanna necessarily go into PR or issue, or I'm sorry, PR 218 yet, unless it has to be solved for the, for the transport, for the Kafka transport. So let me ask that question. Uh, Neil? Yes, because Kafka needs to have a key. Okay, that's what I was wondering. So, so, so Neil, can we? Uh, are you? Uh, is it is it fair then to say we cannot even think about merging your PR until we resolve two eighteen? That's correct. Okay, okay. In that case, well, you can continue. Sorry, I wasn't. I want to make sure of that though. Yeah, it was mainly just a, a a clarification that the producer will not be setting that key anyway because he cannot know what the value should be. It it will be the middleware or something else that actually does the partitioning and knows the strategy that it should be partitioning by. But I just wanted to ask Clemens, why do you think a path expression brings some advantage over just, if you, have, if you want a reference, why are you not just copying the data into the event key extension field or whatever? It, no, you could, you could so, but it's a, it's a subscription operation. So, so basically the event exists, the event exists and now, you're having the Kafka transport provider, however we're, we're, the implementation happens. And now that thing needs to get gets configured to go look at that event and now pick out something from that event that then becomes the key. 
So I think the point is mostly the producer, it's, it's a matter of the, the, the middleware configuration effectively and really addressing the specific concern of your Kafka deployment. Um, and, and how you want to have the downstream consumption model look like is how you want to go and, and select the key. Um, oh, but, oh, so you're, you're saying it wouldn't be the event key field that has the path expression, but rather the configuration for your transport binding. Well, so, no, I haven't, I haven't even, so I, I, I don't think there's necessarily a path expression. There might be, there might be, I, I just said there is some, some kind of expression, some kind of mechanism but with which you can go pick something out of the event. The point is, the point I was trying to make is, we can't assume that a priori, there will be something key-like or Kafka specific key-like in an event that shows up at the, the, the client that goes and takes the event and then renders it onto Kafka. Oh, oh sure. Um, there has been discussion just before in the event key PR, I think, about make that transport could require an extension such as an event key. But I, I do think it sounds very interesting to instead have that configured on the transport configuration instead of in the event. I think. Yeah, I, I, that that is the first time I think where we really talk about some idiosyncratic needs, configuration needs of of a transport. But I think that's the case here. Like we, we really need to write down in the and and this is this is the um, um, it's a little weird because we don't prescribe a particular format, but we would probably prescribe a particular mechanism, uh, or it will actually coarsely describe a mechanism that basically says you need to have a key, and there will be a cloud events message showing up here, and how you derive that key doesn't matter, but the key really needs to be there. I, I don't. I, I I would have to think about how to express it in a normative way, but that's ultimately what it is. The key needs to appear for it, it to be put into Kafka, but the implementation of the Kafka transport needs to construct that from the message, and it okay. might use extension. It might use existing data that's 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 in the in the message. That's really up to the spec, and also I think it's up to the spec how, how specific it wants to be. Okay, and with that, I'm going to have to call time because we're at the top of the hour, but it does sound like we're in agreement that we can't address or can't think about merging the Kafka transport until we resolve 218. So please continue discussion of 218 in the uh, PR itself, um, especially since we're not going to be meeting for the next two weeks. So let's see if we can get that one resolved, and then Neil can finish up the transport, the Kafka transport binding. And with that, let me go back and just quickly do the last roll call for people um, who need to jump off quickly. So Fabio, are you, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Brian, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. David Lyle? Yes, I'm here. Okay, cool. Uh, Ehor, I didn't see hear him. Oh, yeah, Ehor, you left, right? Yeah, I think you left. Uh, Colin, I saw through the chat. Christoph, I heard. Klaus, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Uh, Renato? I think you, you spoke earlier, right? Or maybe not. Renato, are you there? And what about Siraj? S I R. AJ, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, and what about uh, Renato? Or Ihor? Okay, is there anybody I missed for attendance purposes? Uh, Vladimir Bekvansky. Vladimir, okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, cool, in that case, thank you guys very much. And we'll talk in two or three, three weeks, I guess, and um, see some of you in Shanghai. Have a good one. Yes. Bye, everybody. Great. Thanks, Bye. guys. Clemens. Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Clemens. Uh, sure. Yes? Uh, can you write down even just a short description of what we were talking about in the issue, since you actually had the idea and you clearly have more of a clear idea what it, what that is? Uh, sorry, but, which one? Which issue? We talked uh, about the two, two one, two one eight, the event key issue about how it might not be an extension in the actual, it might not be an extension attribute, but rather a configuration of the transport. That's a very... Yeah, uh, to put an ugly picture in your head, think of it as an XPath expression um, or, or some regex. Um, or something of that sort, or or literally a function that you can that you can figure into your Kafka transport, so that it goes and 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 sees an oncoming cloud events message, can run that transform over the message and get the key out. 
it's oh sure thing. sure I, I i get the idea a callback is what i obviously jump to first because i come from javascript but um just to have that idea in the issue because that has not been discussed before it, it's always been discussed as an extension attribute uh yeah field. Uh, yes okay let me let me note that down because I think that actually sounds way more like that makes much more sense because then that eliminates the need for the middleware to modify the event to get the event key in. Yeah, because correct. it's a part it's just, of the transport it's, configuration. Yeah, it's it's a it's an adapter binding configuration element, if you will, and we're prescribing since we're since the, what we're describing is transport. Now, trans transport's an, an abstraction, but we're really being prescriptive about how a piece of code ought to take this abstract notion of a cloud event, which will be backed by code eventually, and then goes and transforms that into a wire projection. That's what the transport bindings do, is they basically prescribe how that software ought to operate. And we now make an extra prescription here that says, and you also need to have a way to go and harvest information from the um, the mess from the input event to go and, and generate synthesize effectively that key. And that might be an extension, but that might you know, however that might be. But it's it's something that is in the obligate is an obligation of the Kafka transport implementation to go and create that. Oh sh sure. Uh, the the yeah. reason I was looking for an extension attribute is that I think it should be surfaced on the consumer side. And the most obvious place to do that would be an extension, but um, that. But the 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 Kafka consumer kind of gets that key. But once you now once you pop out of Kafka, and again, probably doesn't matter. Oh sure, but yeah, but if I have a consumer using Kafka Transport, I would like to know. Yeah, but that which but key you have, was. But you already have that, like like you're walking in with a key. And you have the key is something that is on the message frame itself, right? Right, but if I use an SDK that transforms the, that just gives me a cloud event. Well, then, then that that should that should probably if that if we support extensions if we support transport pluggability, then we we be better have a um, a way to kind of reach back into whatever the underlying transport is. So we can go and find out details because in MQP, oh, sure. uh, so uh, it's it's like you always need to kind of a, a, a tunnel kind of back into the original context um, to get stuff that you can't get out of our abstraction. Oh sure, it could be an accessor next to the actual attribute accessor or data accessor to yeah. have those transfer specific data. So, yeah, th that was some great great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so right. comments, you'll, you'll add some more commentary to the I'll, to the I'll, find, off, right? I'll find that right now because oh, I don't forget. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. I'll talk well, later. Thanks.